Wendy is the education specialist for the Washington State Noxious Weed Control Board. And today she's gonna to be telling us about the 15 species the State Noxious Weed Board added to the Noxious Weed List since 2014. She's gonna focus on identification and she'll talk a little bit about where the plants have been found in Washington and some general management recommendations. She's also gonna to touch upon the different classes of noxious weeds in Washington and what that means for each of these new listings. So at this point, I'm gonna pass the mic over to Wendy and I hope you all enjoy the webinar. All right, thanks Brianna. Good morning, everyone. All right, so for today, I'm gonna to talk about our noxious weed laws in Washington and the classes of noxious weeds, and then go over the 15 uh, new species we've had listed since 2014. Here's the yearly breakdown of what has been added. So when we talk about noxious weeds, this is actually a legal term. Noxious weed is a plant that when is established is highly destructive, competitive, or difficult to control by cultural or chemical practices. We have uh, three main noxious weed laws in Washington. Sort of our overarching noxious weed law is RCW 1710. And the purpose of this law is to limit the economic loss due to the presence and spread of noxious weeds in Washington. And this law holds landowners responsible for controlling noxious weeds on their property. We have WAC 16750, and this is the noxious weed list. So in this law, we list out all of our noxious weeds listed in Washington on the state weed list. And it also it covers the schedule of penalties for failure to control noxious weeds according to the weed law. Also, we have WAC 16752. This is the prohibited plants list, also known as the quarantine list. This is a list of plants whose sale, trade, uh, purchase movement is prohibited within the state of Washington. Now, this list is managed by the Washington State Department of Agriculture. We have many noxious weeds on the quarantine list, but not all of them. So I just want people to be aware that these are two separate lists. We have three classes of noxious weeds in Washington. And when I review our newly listed ones, I'll tell you which class each one is. Uh, class A are those that are noxious weeds that are not native to the state of Washington. They're of limited distribution or they're unrecorded in the state, but pose a threat to invade into the state. And if they do invade, they do pose a serious threat to the state uh, through their negative impacts. Eradication is required of all class A noxious weeds. An example of this is kudzu. As you can see on your screen, kudzu is a vine uh, most famous for invading in the southeast US. This was found in Washington in 2002 down in the Clark County area growing and it was controlled and then added as a class A noxious weed. These are our highest priority noxious weeds. These are really sort of the worst of the worst and again, very limited distribution. And currently we have 36 species listed as class A noxious weeds. Then we have class B noxious weeds in Washington. Class B noxious weeds are those weeds that are not native to the state, and they may be common in some areas of the state, but are limited or do not occur in other areas, but pose a threat to invade into, into those areas. What happens is the state weed board will designate a class B noxious weed in an area for control. So this means that we um, are requiring the control of all seed production, um, of that noxious weed in that area for that calendar year. Currently, we have 66 species listed as class B noxious weeds in Washington. An example of this is Scotch broom, sort of our classic example here. And I'll show you, we have uh, this county level distribution map of Scotch broom in Washington. I'm gonna show you a few of these maps as we uh, go about our talk today. And what this is, um, what this shows are distribution categories of noxious weeds in each county that have been estimated to the best of everyone's knowledge. So the darker the color, the higher number of infested acres in that county. So in Western Washington for Scotch broom, it's quite dark green. So we have a lot of Scotch broom, unfortunately, in Western Washington. But in Eastern Washington, not so much, where they're pretty light, it's pretty light in color. So what we've done at the state is designate Scotch broom for control in all of Eastern Washington, except for Klickitat County. So the goal here is to prevent um, the eastern part of the state from having such a high distribution as we see in Western Washington. So when a class B noxious weed is designated by the state weed board for control, it will automatically go on a county noxious weed list. And we wanna contain control and eventually we want to eradicate these plants. If it's not designated uh, for control in a county, 
a county weed board could still have the ability to require control at the local level. Um, but really the goal here is to prevent the spread of these non-designates to designated areas. And then we have Class C noxious weeds. This is sort of our catch-all category of all other noxious weeds. Commonly, these noxious weeds are already widespread in Washington. Um, they may also be of special interest to the agricultural industry. Now, uh, the State Noxious Weed Board does not require control of Class C noxious weeds, but some counties may um, select the plant for control at the local level. Um, but if the plant is common, usually we'll see uh, people just choosing to focus on uh, technical advice, promoting education, recommending people control these classy noxious weeds. So an example of this is Canada thistle. As you can see by the distribution map, it's quite common throughout Washington, unfortunately, uh, but there are some areas in Eastern Washington where control is required at the local level uh, for agricultural reasons. And right now we have 51 species listed as class C noxious weeds. So at the state weed list, you can think of it as sort of our master noxious weed list. Um, from that, the counties adopt their noxious weed list, and they have all the class A's on their noxious weed list, the class B's that are designated by the state, class B's and C's that are selected locally for control, and then all their plants they want to promote education on. In order for a plant to be um, listed as a noxious weed, it has to go through a process that we conduct each year. Right now we're in this first phase from January until the end of April. Anyone can submit a proposal for a plant to be listed as a noxious weed or for a change in the noxious weed list. So if you have a plant you would like to uh, consider, have considered as a noxious weed, you have until April 30th to submit uh, proposals to us and we have information on our website about how to do that. All right, I'm gonna jump in now to our new, newish uh, noxious weeds that were listed within the last uh, five years. For 2014, we have three species that were added. Uh, so I'm gonna jump into our noxious weed listing of lesser celandine by Caria verna. This is uh, listed as a class B noxious weed. It's an herbaceous perennial that's native to Europe, Asia, and North Africa. It grows from tuberous roots. Uh, during the talk today, I'm going to use a little cursor arrow, so you can see the arrow I'm pointing out certain features of these plants. So in the lower right corner, we have these tuberous roots that are somewhat club shaped and the plants grow from that. We have leaves that grow up uh, from the base and also some stem leaves on the plant. The leaf blade shape is kidney to heart shaped, and we can have somewhat wavy margins as well as smooth margins. You'll also see sometimes some modeling on uh, the leaf surface of the plant, and these plants are hairless. The flowers then occur uh, single at the top of the stems, generally about an inch in diameter, and they flower um, early spring, about March to April. So the flowers have many petals on average about seven to 12, and they will have sepals here about three to four under the petals you can see in this photo. Once the flowers are pollinated, they form these uh, globe-shaped heads of called achenes. But essentially, each of these little bumps here have a seed in them. The plants can spread successfully by seed and also by structure. You can see on the right in this photo called bull bills. So on the stems, there's these little cream-colored balls. They look like little osmocote fertilizing pellets that the plant produces that can fall off the stems and uh, vegetatively grow into a new plant. Now for lesser salinity, one plant that can look similar uh, when you're um, out looking around for noxious weeds is a native plant, the yellow marsh marigold, uh, Caltha palestris. So a couple of key traits to help you distinguish uh, between the two. One can be growth habit. The marsh marigold grows as a clump Whereas with the lesser celandine, as I'll show you a picture, it will grow as quite a dense ground cover. Also with the yellow marsh marigold, it does not produce those little bull bills on the stem that we saw, those little cream colored balls. And then when we have flowers, we do not have any, um, looks like sepals on this plant. Actually, these look like petals, but they are sepals, but we don't have the sepals and petals like we do here in lesser celandine, where you can see the longer petals and these shorter sepals. Overall, the lesser celandine will also have more petals um, than the marsh marigold and blooms earlier. So just to give you a 
little taste here of its short life cycle. Uh, Lester celandine um, generally comes up early in the spring in February. Here it is forming a dense ground cover up in Whatcom County. Here it is in April. It's in full bloom. Um, and then come July, the plant has finished blooming, going to seed, and has died back, died back down to the ground. And I just want you to note that this is a very short time period that the plant is completing its life cycle. And also, there's really no other understory plants in this area. The lesser salmia has really crowded everything else out. So these plants like to grow in moist, shaded woodlands, wetlands, stream banks, along uh, waterways, but as well as in ornamental areas, like in lawns here. It spreads very readily into lawns. In Washington, we found this mostly so far in western Washington, um, escaping a little bit in eastern Washington as well. And in the lower right corner, these yellow dots are data points that uh, landmanders have been starting to collect about where they have found lesser celandine escaping. This plant is challenging to control, uh, especially uh, because of its short life cycle, because the window of opportunity is short. So up in Whatcom County, they have noted that they generally have about a month and a half to really try to control this plant while it's present. We really want to prevent the spread of this plant, prevent um, introducing it to new areas, perhaps through a soil that has uh, the vegetative structures in it. Control can be carefully done through some um, hand removal, digging out plants carefully and disposing it properly. Do not compost these plants. Some smothering as well as some herbicide treatments can be effective as well. But this plant will take a lot of repeat uh, monitoring and management. Our next noxious weed listing is non-native typha species and their hybrids. This is a non-native cattails and their hybrids. And these are grouped together as a class C noxious weed listing. And this includes the species uh, Typha angustifolia, that's a narrow leaf cattail, Typha dominogensis, that's the southern cattail, as well as a hybrid between our uh, native and um, the dominogensis, or angustifolia, excuse me, the Typha glauca. So in general, you're probably familiar with cattails. Uh, they grow all around us. They're perennial plants uh, growing from thick rhizome. They have stems that are either vegetative with um, long, narrow leaves, and they also, some of them will produce the flowering stems. The flowers then are this typical, I'd say, cattail structure. We have uh, male flowers at the top, this section, the slider section on this photo. And then the lower section are all the female flowers. And I always think the female flower flowers look like a corn dog. So that's just something that helps me remember <laughs> and compare it to others. So um, the plants will be pollinated and they can spread by seed as well as uh, through their rhizomes or sections of rhizomes. One note is that the hybrid, uh, the Typha glauca does not produce viable seed. Now, cattails can have quite variable traits. We do have our native cattail species, uh, which is common cattail or broadleaf cattail. You can see in the lower left here. This is not included in the listing, only the non native species. For the native cattail, it does have broad, flat leaves. And the lower right here, this is a picture of its leaf blade. The width can vary some. And then here in the center photo of the two samples, the ones on the left are the native, and we have the female flowers and then the male flowers right above it. Essentially, there's no gap in between the two. Now on our non-native species and hybrids, we will commonly see a gap between the female flowers and the male flowers. This gap can vary in size, a couple examples here, but this is one trait to help us um, clue in to a non-native cattail being present. Sometimes the native will have this gap, but it's not common for that to occur. So generally when you see the gap, it will be one of these non-natives. Here's a couple other examples I wanted to show you. We have the narrow leaf cattail, Typhon gustifolia on the left with the big gap. In the center, we have a comparison of the native on the left, the narrow leaf cattail in the center, and then the hybrid between those two on the right. And if you look closely on the center one, even though the male flowers are gone, you can still see kind of a greenish smooth section of stem above the female flowers. So even if the male flowers have um, deceased and died back for the year, you can still look for that section above the female to help you tell if it's native or not. Now, cattails grow in wet, saturated 
soils and marshes, generally wet areas, lake shores, pond margins, wetlands, ditches, bogs. So all sorts of wet areas, like damp, wet soils. Uh, what we're finding with these non-native species and hybrid, it is displacing native species as well as the native cattails. Uh, they're able to also grow into deeper waters in areas with higher salinity. Um, so they're really taking over a larger area. They're also able to, of course, hybridize with our native cattail. So far, um, we see a limited distribution of these non-native species and the hybrids in Washington. So this map here in the lower left corner, um, all the hash marks you see for the counties um, mean that the plant is present, but the extent is unknown. So we do have a few locations of it growing, but I think we're still learning about where these cattails, non-native cattails may be occurring, or we just know of where they are and it's quite limited distribution. And this map on the right also shows these yellow dots where um, they have been found and reported. Um, so briefly, uh, there's many methods of control that can be used on cattails. So cutting, um, smothering, um, people say uh, cutting the plant uh, below the water line, repeat mowing this can be effective, tarping small patches uh, where the, it's exposed on a bank can be effective. Herbicides have also been used uh, effectively from, to control them. Remember that um, if you're applying herbicides in an aquatic area, you need a uh, aquatic a license and a permit to apply those aquatic herbicides. And of course, it's important to monitor and follow up uh, managing where necessary. All right, our next noxious weed listing is Russian olive, Eleagnus angustifolia. This is a class C noxious weed. It's a deciduous uh, multi stem shrub or small tree. Generally, plants are growing up to about 25, 35 feet at their max, sometimes perhaps a little taller. It can have a deep uh, root, rooting system and is able to uh, fix nitrogen. Uh, the older trunks or uh, bark on the plant has a shredding brown look to it. And then the younger stems are more of a smooth brown. Um, and on the lower right here, you can see those younger twigs and they will have be covered somewhat in these little silvery scales. So have can have a silvery sheen to it. And then also, as you can see at this lower right picture is we have uh, these thorns. So sporadically throughout the plant, um, we can have these very painful thorns that occur. The leaves are arranged uh, alternate to each other on the stem. They're narrow up to about three inches or so long with smooth margins, so smooth edges. And they're covered um, on the top and bottom by these little silvery scales. So this gives it definitely a nice silvery uh, color to it. It also is um, helpful for identification. The plants then produce uh, fragrant yellow flowers, either one to many in a cluster that come out of where the leaves attach to the plant. The flowers are actually four sepals that are fused at the base and then they're sort of splayed open here at the tip and they're yellow inside. We don't have any uh, true petals here and it has uh, four stamens. So the plants are pollinated and then they develop these little olive-like looking fruits, hence the name Russian olive. And they're also covered in these uh, little silvery scales, so it gives it a silvery appearance um, when they're uh, fresh. They will then age to more of a tan brown color, and especially you'll see that in the winter months if they're still occurring on the plant. Each of the fruits has uh, one seed in them, and they're eaten by birds and some wildlife, wildlife and spread to new locations. So Russian olive uh, spreads along waterways. It's a well-known uh, non-native invasive plant as it's um, really established along all of our major rivers in the interior Western United States. And we see that also in Washington occurring along our rivers, along as well as irrigation waterways, right-of-ways, floodplains, lakes, areas with, it does like some wet soil. Uh, you can see in this map in the upper right uh, corner, we're definitely we're seeing it more in Eastern Washington. A little bit in Western Washington where plants have escaped from some ornamental plantings. General uh, Russian olive can outcompete native plants, especially these native riparian community, uh, communities and species like willows, which are very important. And their seeds can germinate in sun, but as well as in the shade. And they're providing an advantage to themselves um, in that some of these native species like native willows prefer to germinate and will only germinate in open conditions. 
So it's creating an environment for itself uh, to establish and spread. So just uh, a note in controlling the plants, watch out for thorns. It can be quite painful. So you wanna protect yourself with thick clothing. Um, seedlings can be dug out as well as small plants. Cutting alone, just cutting back the plants will not kill it. They will stump sprout um, or sprout some from the roots. Um, so sometimes cutting and then applying an herbicide can be an effective treatment that's used. So as well as basil bark treatments or foliar treatments are used to control Russian olive. All right, so for the next year, we have uh, four species that were listed as noxious weeds, three of these uh, big grasses. So first I'll start with Ravenna grass, uh, Saccharum Ravenna. This uh, was listed this year as, as 2015 as a class A noxious weed. And then just to note in 2017, we did reclassify it as a class B noxious weed. So uh, this plant is also known as uh, hardy pampas grass. And if you're familiar with pampas grass, which I'm gonna talk about next, uh, you might be able to see why just by the general uh, look of it, its appearance. Um, this plant's native to Asia, Europe, uh, North Africa. It's very tall, upright growth, and an ornamental plant that forms this large clump or tussock of leaves at the base. And this tussock that grows is up to about four feet tall or so. And then it has stems that extend up to around uh, 13 feet with uh, plumes at the top. So the leaves are about uh, three to four feet long on that lower tussock and a half to one inch wide. It can have uh, this white mid vein. And then what's notable for identification is at the leaf sheath here, as well as on the upper surface of the base of the leaf, we have these dense, tawny, creamy hairs. This is a very helpful identification trait for Ravenna grass. Um, beside that then, we have the flowering stems later in the season will sometimes get this reddish color on them. You see in the lower left picture. And then at the top of the flowering stems, we have these plumes of flowers, uh, which are um, can be quite silvery and shimmery and then they produce a viable seed. And the stalks will remain through the winter on the plants. So Ravenna grass um, has been found spreading from ornamental plantings. This is an ornamental plant uh, that's been fairly popular in Eastern Washington um, in landscape settings. From that, they're finding a lot of seeds that are blowing, spread on the wind, water through people into new areas and establishing. In this map here you can see we have kind of in the central uh, part of the state as well as some eastern counties uh, noted populations. So for control, um, actually the most common recommendation people use is digging up plants. So this is a bunch of grass. So if you can get in and dig down and dig the plants out, you can have fairly successful control. You want to monitor for re-sprouts, but um, generally uh, digging out the plant will control the plant that first time. If you can't dig out the plant, we recommend cutting back the plumes so as to not um, allow seeds to form. Uh, spot treatments have also been used of herbicide. Uh, using, for example, glyphosate alone or mixed with imazepir um, have shown some uh, good results. And then with these, and I would say with all of our uh, noxious weeds we're talking about removing, think about uh, replacing uh, the area, replanting the area with native plants, or um, non-native but non-invasive plants to provide competition. All right, next we have uh, pampas grass, Cordidaria celawana, and jubata grass, Cordidaria jubata. So these were each listed as class C noxious weeds, but I'm going to talk about them together as they're quite similar looking. Uh, these are large, uh, densely tufted perennial grasses. So again, we're looking at a large uh, grass that's forming these tussocks, these clumps of all these leaves that are coming out from the base. They have long basal leaves, uh, length varying between like three and six feet. And these have very sharply serrated margins. So if you reach into this plant and pull your hand back, you can definitely get scratched. Um, I've been there, it's happened, and uh, can draw some blood. So it's something you want to be careful around if you're working with these plants. The plants then produce these flowering stems. Uh, with these showy uh, plumes um, at the top. So for each species, they have a little bit different flower structure. For the pampas grass, uh, the plants are functionally dioecious, so meaning that we have male and female flowers on separate plants. And generally, in the horticulture trade, 
the female flowered plants were the ones sold. But in some recent years, uh, plants were um, grown by seed at the nurseries and they weren't sure. They accidentally also induced some male plants. So, so that's how we have male female plants that can occur out in landscapes. For the jubata grass, these are all female flowers, and then they're actually able asexually to produce seeds in that inflorescence. So both species can um, spread by seed, and both can produce hundreds of thousands of seeds per plant. So just a quick, there are some um, traits you can look at the two together at the mature plants to tell them apart. This is just a sampling of some of those traits. So for example, jubata grass, the tussock, the clump, three to five feet uh, tall at maturity, whereas pampas grass can be six up to 13 feet at maturity. In jubata grass, the leaves are more spreading horizontally, or more kind of outspreading, maybe a little more smooshed looking on top, say, versus the pampas grass, which can have more of a fountain appearance where the leaves kind of go up and out like a fountain of water. Um, the flowering stems uh, growing above the, the tussocks on jubata grass generally are three to six feet above the tussock, whereas on the pampas grass, if you have a female flowering plant, it can be up to three feet tall, and if you have a male flowering plant, up to six feet tall. The coloring can be helpful. The plumes on the immature jubata grass can be deep violet, but then they'll mature to kind of a pinkish, kind of a dingy tan color. Whereas on the pampas grass, the immature flowers on the female are white. Um, immature to quite a nice bright kind of white cream color, whereas the males can be white to violet and sometimes will mature to still have that pinkish tan color. So these plants are dispersed by seed on, on wind as well as through human activities where, where we do plant them. They can crowd out native species along, especially along coastlines. Uh, this lower right picture is out of California where they've had quite a problem with uh, both species in different areas and have been found that uh, down in California that they are reducing really forest regeneration. They're getting the areas after it's been logged and really suppressing uh, tree uh, seedlings uh, germination. These large clumps also prevent access to fires as well as present a fire hazard themselves. It can grow in all sorts of different environments. They definitely like disturbed areas, roadsides, um, coastal areas, coastal shrub areas. Um, they can also be somewhat more inland, but generally those areas are moderated by maritime influences. So um, we can also see them along inland riparian areas, and that's where some moisture is sufficient. And that's definitely more so for the pampas grass species. When we listed this plant, really what prompted uh, it to be added was that year in Olympia, there was a site found that had almost 500 plants that were spread, and there's a map here, all those red dots were uh, these plants that were found in this area very successfully seeding, flowering, just spreading aggressively throughout this site. At that time also there were plants found in other, some other coastal um, uh, areas. Uh, Tacoma had an area of almost 100 plants that were found. In Grayland there's a site there are a few plants. So definitely finding it along these coastal areas. And in the lower left corner here we have some maps of herbarium records, so the little orange dots indicate where herbarium specimens were collected. So we've had a few more of the pampas grass specimens collected than jubata grass. And then here we have some of uh, the county level distribution maps that reflect that on the left having more pampas grass found. So in general for a control, again, we want to protect ourselves with these plants so we don't get all scratched up. Um, wearing heavy gloves, you can see like in this picture. Removing the plumes so that you're not uh, adding seeds into the environment is very important. Pulling, digging out crowns can be successful. If you're digging out a plant that's gonna be left there on the ground, turn it over so the plant might not reroot if it's a moist uh, environment. Larger plants can be dug out. Um, usually people are using a combination of treatments. So perhaps cutting back the plant, treating that regrowth with perhaps an herbicide or burning the plant, but then, um, once those plants are controlled, again, planting these areas with competitive species. All right, next we have Italian arum, uh, arum metallicum. This is a class C noxious weed. This is a perennial herbaceous plant that grows from tubers. And on this picture in the center, these are kind of cleaned up tubers, but these are the small little tubers that the uh, plants grow from. This plant is an interesting, um, life cycle. So in the fall, 
leaves will emerge and we have leaves that are very arrowhead shaped uh, when they're mature and they have this modeling on them kind of marbling yellowish to cream color uh, the leaf here on the right is even a little bit almost um, broader more triangular in shape and then when the leaves are younger we have in the lower right corner more of an oval shaped without this modeling but eventually as the plant ages you will see this more typical mature uh, leaf shape so these uh, leaves will emerge in the fall. They may die back in the winter if it's a cold environment and then reemerge in the spring, or they may be present all through the winter. And then in the spring, we have flowers that will emerge. So the flowers have the structure called a spathe and spadex. And essentially what this looks like is almost like a big sort of petal-like structure that wraps around this almost like finger-like structure, which has the male and female flowers on it. Um, they have a displeasing odor, and that's to attract pollinators. And once the female flowers are pollinated, they form these uh, orangish red berries. And these berries then contain generally one to four seeds. Uh, birds do like to eat these berries and spread the seeds around. And when the plants are fruit, generally the leaves will die back down in the summer. So you will have this uh, case where you just have these stems with the berries on them without leaves around. So plants reproduce by seeds, but I would say even more notably, they spread by their tubers. So tubers in the soil can divide and essentially form daughter tubers, we call them, uh, which very easily then are spread to new locations in the soil um, and uh, really expand the population quickly. So uh, along with that though, birds can, of course, as I mentioned, disperse the seeds and they could be dispersed along water. Plants can form this dense ground cover layer, um, which can outcompete uh, some of our native plant communities. This picture on the upper right is a uh, infestation out in San Juan Islands. They've had a lot of trouble uh, with it uh, spreading aggressively out there. The plants um, do have toxic properties. So uh, do not ingest this plant. It can make you sick. You may need uh, medical treatment. And then for some people, this plant, if you have sensitive skin, it can cause a uh, skin rash when handling it and like breaking the plant. So we encourage people to wear gloves when handling it. Italian arum is found commonly in forest understories, uh, riparian areas, old gardens where it's escaped out and grown into new locations. So commonly near urban development. And you'll see on the map here in the lower right uh, corner, this has so far been found mostly in Western Washington, but a few Eastern Washington uh, locations as well. And I think where we're seeing it, for example, like in Columbia County, um, people are um, seeing it spread from ornamentally planted areas. So a tie arm is difficult to control. This is a really challenging plant uh, once it is established on a site. Again, we recommend wearing gloves. You can dig out small infestations. Carefully, I would say, like really follow maybe a leaf down, try to dig that tuber out, collect any little daughter tubers that are around. You're going to bag up and trash the, that material. Do not put it in home compost. Um, that's not necessarily going to kill those plant parts. Um, there has been some work with smothering it. So in the upper right corner, this is out of uh, San Juan, where they try to do some covering with black plastic. But as you can see, you must be careful and uh, watch and maintain your cover so you don't get any holes in it, because the plant will then uh, come right back. But smothering it um, can be something successful, but uh, would take a number of years. Herbicide trials, we've had um, some preliminary work has been done that has done some top kill of the foliage, but actually this picture of tubers is from that study. The tubers looked just fine at the end of the study. So um, the recommendation is if you are using an herbicide, you could try mixing some different uh, products um, just to see if you can, we can attack it from some different um, modes of action. All right, moving on to 2016, we have English hawthorn uh, was listed as a noxious weed, also known as common hawthorn or one-seeded hawthorn. This is a class C noxious weed um, that is native to parts of Europe, Asia, and North Africa. It's a deciduous uh, tree to a large shrub, typically has many stems. Um, the small branches or twigs that come off the main stems generally are spine-tipped, as you can see. Um, so this plant, again, is another one to be uh, careful when you're working around. 
The leaves are deciduous and they're alternate um, on the stems and commonly you may see them clustered in short shoots, which is what we're seeing in this lower picture. They're kind of clustered together. They can have a uh, beyond petioles and which are little leaf stems. And then the leaf blade is up to about two and a half inches in size. And what's notable here is they're broader at the overall broader at the base and uh, more narrow towards the tip. And they have three to seven deep lobes. lobes. So these deep lobes here are very um, distinguishing for this plant. This picture in the lower right corner shows it here where it's divided into the three lobes. And then um, towards the tip, we have some toothing as well on these lobes. The flowers that are in these dense flat top clusters, uh, 10 to 20 flowers per cluster. These are uh, white. Uh, which can kind of age sometimes to a pink color with five petals and many stamens. And the stamens, as you can see on this picture on the right, um, <clears throat> when the just opening the pollen can have this kind of violet purplish color. It's quite pretty. And then they will have one style here coming out of the center of the flower. The flowers then form these um, fruits, which are palms technically. And here we have the immature fruits on the upper left. And you can see it does have persistent um, dried sepals on the bottom of the fruit. And they mature to a bright red color, uh, up to almost a half inch uh, long in size. And they have one nutlet, generally, per fruit. Every once in a while there's two, but generally one. And that relates uh, as well to its scientific name, monogyna, which is one seeded. I did want to point out we have a, a na our native uh, black hawthorn as a comparison, also called Douglas hawthorn, Cortegas douglasii. This is also a deciduous tree. And just to look at some differences here, one would be the leaves. These here are weakly lobed. So you do have some toothing um, on these leaves as well, but not the deep three to seven lobes that we see on the English hawthorn. We also have white flowers with five petals. Um, only 10 stamens here, and we have uh, five styles coming out of the center, which then form fruits that mature to a deep red to blackish color. So the fruits also are a very helpful identification trait. But really, even just looking at the leaves, even if it's before the plant has flowered, you can um, distinguish the two. So English hawthorn uh, grows full sun. It is somewhat shade tolerant. It likes, uh, generally likes some damp soil, found in disturbed areas, forest edges, woodlands, riparian areas, grasslands. It's quite opportunistic and grow, can grow in a lot of different settings. And it can really grow into thickets. So this lower right uh, corner here is a picture of it really filling up this whole field area. It can be a problem in some agricultural areas. Uh, it's been noted in San Juan County invading some of their agricultural uh, fields. It's also uh, invading to some of our more sensitive plant communities like our oak, oak woodlands. Oh, uh, I should also note the map here in the center. You can see more common in Western Washington um, and probably in some of these counties like Pierce County, it occurs, but we just don't have the data on that at this time. But it can be found in a few areas of Western, uh, Eastern Washington as well. So for control, again, watch out for thorns. Uh, protect yourself from those. Uh, monitor for seedlings. So birds eat and spread these uh, seeds around. So it's something that you can watch an area, even if a tree is not nearby, I would still say watch out for seedlings. Look for little plants that have those lobe leaves. Uh, they can be dug out. Um, and if you're digging out, you can dig out a little bit bigger plants, but make sure to try to get the crown of that plant. Cutting alone generally won't kill the plant. You'll just get uh, stump sprouts. So, but you can cut back the plant and then treat it uh, with an herbicide. And then just to know when we're controlling plants that are mature, try to not control it when it has fruit on the plant, mature fruit, as those could be easily uh, distributed to new areas. Our next noxious weed listing is Medusa head, Tenanthorum caput medusae. Uh, this is a class C noxious weed uh, native to the Mediterranean region. It's a winter annual. So in the fall, once an area gets 
some uh, enough moisture, enough rain, the seeds will germinate and the plants will overwinter and then will um, grow in the spring and flower and fruit. In general, they're growing up to about two feet tall. What's notable here for Medusa is we have this, the flower, the spike. It's this very crowded um, spike-like inflore spike inflorescence that has uh, seeds with these long awns on them. These long, look like hairs coming out um, that are straight when they're immature. And then as they age, they will dry and twist, can get somewhat twisted and look a little scraggly. And this is where it gets its name, a Medusa head looking like Medusa with her head of snakes. So it has this very interesting uh, feature to it. Um, this little, the awns that are on these seeds have little barbs on them that help them to stick to people, animals, and help them to disperse around to new locations. In general, Medusa head will mature uh, later than a lot of, of these other winter annual grasses that are around. So generally it's noted two to four weeks on average. So if you're out, say in the summer, you see a lot of dry brown grasses um, in the lower left corner, we have a nice uh, infestation. Medusa head has this bright green kind of silvery appearance to it. It still um, hasn't fully matured yet. Medusa head is also noted for having a high silica content on average about 8%. Because of this it, the plant uh, will break down slowly and because of that it will create this thatch layer um, on the soil. Now I also want to jump to talking about bentonata, bentonata dubia also known as African wiregrass. This was also listed as a class C noxious weed the same year. Um, this is another non-native uh, winter annual grass that uh, grows same as with Medusa head. It uh, seeds will germinate in the fall once it has some moisture. Uh, the grass you can see the structure here on the right is uh, basally branched. It has most of the leaves on the lower um, half of the stem. And then the inflorescence is more pyramidal in overall shape. When it's mature, we can look at uh, the leaves and the leaf ligule. That's this little structure here on this lower left picture. It's a little kind of um, scraggly piece that comes up when you pull the leaf back from the stem. The node will also turn this sort of purplish color. And then also when you pull the leaf back, the sheath of the leaf wraps around the stem, it will just gently pull back, it won't tear. Some grasses that is fused, so if you pulled this leaf back, there would be a tearing here along this part of the stem. But here, these are open sheaths, we call them, and you can pull that back and it won't tear, it just um, opens. The spikelets then um, are generally three per little group, and one of them will commonly have this bent on that is somewhat twisted, and this is also a helpful identification trait. Bentonata also contains silica, like Medusa head, in overall less, but it can still create a, a thatch layer. So for both of these um, invasive grasses, they are weeds of agricultural systems, pastures, rangelands. They're also invading uh, native communities, like native sagebrush communities, shrub communities, and out competing um, native plants, um, including as well as forage species. For the, um, for the most part, Medusa head and Bentonata are not palatable to uh, wildlife or livestock because of that silica content. There is a very, very small window of opportunity of grazing when the plants are quite young, but is very limited. Generally, it's tough if someone's gonna actually rely on that for uh, forage to time that correctly. Uh, these plants then with a the thatch can create fuels that can then are flammable and can help to change fire cycles of a system um, really fueling more frequent fires that the native plants, plants of the area aren't adapted to. So with the fires that we've had uh, recently in Washington, there has been a noted increase in some of these grasses, especially uh, Ventanata. So talking with some people down in Klickitat County, they said uh, the fires in the gorge recently that they're really seeing an increase in spread of uh, Ventanata in that area. We have the two distribution maps of the species, a Medusa head at the top and then that not below. These grasses uh, do occur a lot of the same um, environments, though Ventnata can grow somewhat in somewhat uh, more moist conditions. So we are seeing it some in Western Washington. You see a few counties here, King and Lewis, um, Skamania, with uh, noted with having some plants. 
So for control, uh, one thing to think about if you have this is to try to target removing or breaking out that thatch layer that has formed um, in the area. And that is because we want to allow an uh, environment where the native plants or other forage plants can establish and grow that are suppressed by that thatch. And also that can improve the efficacy if you're applying the soil um, uh, with soil applied herbicides. And I would just also note about those thatch layers, um, really the Medusa head is adapted to for the seeds to germinate and go through that thatch, whereas our uh, native species are not. So again, maybe some targeted early grazing could be possible in some cases. We want to establish competitive, desirable plants to really compete with these um, invaders. And then where you ha we're having large um, invasions of these species, really herbicide treatments is um, what we're looking at to be successful. All right, we're jumping up now to 2018. Uh, we had five new noxious weeds listed for 2018, so it was a, a busy year. I'm going to cover first these two uh, impatient species, the small flower jewelweed and the spotted jewelweed. I did want to mention that we do have some native impatient species in Washington, three of them here. Uh, we have the pale yellow touch me not or jewelweed, the spurless touch me not, and also the western touch me not. Now we do also then have these four non native species that have been found and documented in Washington. We have the impatient glandulifera, the impatient parviflora, uh, the species balforii, and then the spotted. And I'm going to talk, oh, and then I did want to mention that, unfortunately, we have a hybrid that can occur to one of our native species, the spurless touch me not, and the spotted jewelweed. I'm going to talk about these two uh, non-native species that were added. First, the small flower jewelweed in Patients Parviflora was added as a class A noxious weed. And it's native to parts of Asia. It's an annual. It's hairless, it grows up to about a meter, so about three feet tall, but can be much shorter and still can flower and go to fruit. And the leaves are alternately arranged on the plant, but they're kind of crowded up and almost look like they're spiraling out on growth, but they are alternate each other. The leaves um, have these sharply toothed or serrated margins, you can see in these photos. And then we have flowers that occur in clusters of one to a few, that come from the upper leaf axils where the leaf attaches to the stem. You'll have a little stem come out with the flowers occurring. Here we have a small pale yellow flowers with a spur. So with impatience, um, generally we're looking at these mature flowers, these colorful flowers to key out the plants or to identify them. And certain things like if the flower has a spur or not, if it's curved or straight, will really help us um, to figure out which species we have. So for the small flowered uh, jewelweed, we have a short straight spur on these pale yellow flowers. And I should note that some of these um, flower buds that will occur on these plants won't open and the plant is able to self fertilize and create seeds from those. The flowers then um, form into these capsules. They're about an un up to an inch long and they elastically dehisce. So essentially when they're mature, and we touch them, they can spring open and expel uh, one to five seeds. So that's one of the common names touch me not comes from, uh, for if you touch it, it will um, send seeds out a short distance. Uh, plants spread by seed, this again is an annual, producing 200 to up to 1,000 or 2,000 per plant. Um, this plant is a noted invader in Europe, so this lower picture is actually taken from Europe, really forming um, dense layers in forested understories, dominating the herbaceous layer. In our area, this is quite rare. So, so far we have found just two locations in Washington. There's been one found um, in the Portland area, a little bit in Vancouver, Canada, but those are older specimens. Um, so the two sites were found in King County that we know of, growing in part shade to shaded environments, dry to moist soils, but I would say where it's been found so far in King County, the soils are quite dry um, and like shaded areas. Uh, control, hand pulling, these are pretty easy to hand pull. They have just small fibrous roots and um, herbicide treatments can work as well with some larger infestations. Then we have the spotted jewelweed, Impatience compensis, also called spotted touch me not. This one was listed as a class C noxious weed. Now, this plant actually, a um, number of years ago, was thought to be native to the area, but through uh, research conducted uh, by Peter Zika, he was able to determine, actually, it's not native to here. 
It's native east of the Rocky Mountains and, and into of the US and Canada. <clears throat> Excuse me, these are hairless annuals um, growing up to about two to five feet tall. The leaves are alternate each other on the stem. They have a leaf stem up to about an inch and a half long, and then the blades are up to almost five inches long. And they have sort of this more scalloped, uh, rounded tooth margin. And if you look kind of on the underside, you can see these little teeth um, along the edges. Uh, in the lower right corner here, just to show you an example of a, this is a policeman's helmet uh, on the right. And then we have the spotted uh, jewelweed on the left. So definitely can see a little bit of difference there in the leaf margin. The flowers then, which are going to really, again, help us to identify this plant, are spurred. So you do have this little spur on the back, but here we have a curved spur. So remember with the uh, other one with the pale yellow flowers, a straight spur, here we have a curved spur. And the flowers overall are kind of this orangish color that has this reddish, uh, dark orange spotting that can be variable in how dense it is. So you can see on this one picture, it almost is covering these lower lips uh, of the flowers. Generally, the, fl the flowers are spotted. Sometimes you will get a situation where the flowers aren't spotted, but within the population of where the plant is growing, you will see a lot of spotted flowers. So this is more an anomaly to see it without spots. And every once in a while, you can also see um, this lower right-hand corner color, this kind of creamy color with this more purpley violet spotting. Again, this is kind of rare to see. For the most part, you're gonna always be seeing these flowers that are spotted blooming later summer, um, August to October. Uh, it also produces a capsule about an inch long. Um, it also explosively uh, dehisses or um, expels the seed a short distance, about four to six feet. Uh, the seed here is small in the upper right corner. This is an immature seed, a mature seed will be black. Spotted jewelweed is found on moist soils, um, ditches, along streams, wetlands, um, shaded to um, open areas, understories. It can grow in quite a variety of settings. And as you can see by this map on the right, this is a map of herbarium specimens. It has been quite common in uh, Western Washington, documented in a lot of locations. So one concern with this plant it is hybridizing with one of our native uh, jewelweed species, the spurless jewelweed. So on the upper left picture here, this is the spurless jewelweed. You can see no spurs, just rounded at the back. And then on the right, we have the spotted with the rounded spur. So when these hybridize, when they grow together, which they can, um, you will get one of two cases. You'll have um, flowers that are not spotted and have a spur, or you'll have flowers that are spotted and with no spur. And you'll see then a mix of these all together growing at the site. Um, spotted jewelweed can also grow a lot of tough conditions. It can really form these dense areas of growth. This upper right picture here is actually seeds. So just dense carpets of seedlings can form um, uh, this plant in these areas. Lately, it seems like populations have been increased in Washington. So land managers um, brought this to our attention. This is why it was listed as a Class C, as it seems population increasing, and especially in areas where not weed control has been taking place along these rip uh, our riparian areas. Again, these plants can be hand pulled. Uh, these are uh, plants with very fibrous, uh, shallow roots, and also herbicide could be used in some cases. Again, if we're applying herbicide in aquatic settings, though, we need a uh, aquatic uh, license as well as a permit. All right, then we have European coltsfoot. Uh, this is a class B noxious weed native to parts of Europe, Asia, North Africa. This is a rhizomatous perennial growing up to about 20 inches tall. The flowering stems emerge first in the spring on these short stems with these uh, small little simple leaves. They are yellow. This is the aster family. So we have a compound flower head of disc and ray flowers. It looks kind of like a yellow daisy flower. And then as the flowers uh, form and then turn to fruit, which in the lower left corner here, you can see we have seeds, a puffball of seeds essentially with hairs on them that help them disperse. We will have larger leaves emerge from the rhizomes. So we have these larger uh, leaves that are somewhat hairy on top, but can be densely hairy on the bottom, somewhat heart-shaped to rounded with a variable leaf margin. 
Seed production does vary on this plant, but it can uh, produce seed and be spread by seed. Uh, but also it spreads by rhizomes. I think I kind of skipped through that picture. I'm gonna go back. So this picture here shows we have these cream colored rhizomes that break apart very easily and help the plant spread to new locations. Just to compare uh, briefly to, we have our native sweet colt's foot um, in the center here. Flower heads on this though are white and occur in a cluster at the top of this stem instead of a single flower. And the leaves here do have very, are deeply lobed, uh, whereas not so much here on the European colt's foot. And then we also have uh, seeds again that are occurring in a cluster of uh, seed heads versus just one that we see at the European colt's foot. And then I just put the put a pathfinder as well. Um, a genocoline bicolor. This is a native uh, trail plant you'll see. It does have somewhat two-tone leaves as well with this hairy kind of whitish underside, but it has white flowers that occur in a cluster at the top of the stems. We're finding European colt's foot in shaded, disturbed environments. Um, it can also be dispersed in agricultural settings and along waterways. Um, it's also been a plant that's been noted to grow in areas where not weed control has happened. So Unfortunately, we're controlling one noxious weed. We are creating sometimes an environment that something else can invade. So far though, this plant has been found in Western Washington. This lower left map of those yellow dots show where we have documented populations. So it's not very common um, to find so far. And so we're really trying to encourage um, people to learn about this plant and then control it. Let me skip through that for time. I did wanna mention for control that small amounts can be dug up. Um, it's helpful to establish competition. Uh, European cults, but does not like competition. It does uh, dramatically reduce the abundance of the plant. And also a herbicide can be used to control plants. And you wanna make sure though, to apply it to fully emerged leaves. Uh, then we have Malta star thistle as a new noxious weed listing for 2018. It is a class B noxious weed. It's very similar looking to yellow star thistle, if you're familiar with that. It's a winter annual that uh, germinates uh, in the fall once it has rains, growing up to a full maturity about three feet tall, covered in this sort of loosely gray uh, hairs, which give it a sort of silvery appearance. It begins as this basal rosette of lobe leaves with a rounded uh, leaflet at the tip. And then when it grows stems, it has these more narrow, smooth margin leaves up near the flower heads. Flower heads are solitary or in um, groups of two to three, kind of egg-shaped overall at the base here. And we have some cobwebby hairs. And what's most notable are these spines that come out that commonly have this uh, brownish, uh, purplish color at the base. This is a yellow star thistle um, to the right of this on this lower left picture. And it generally has longer spines up to about an inch. We have about half inch spines on the Malta star thistle. Uh, in Washington, so far, we've had herbarium records, but they're all quite historical, mainly before 1939. Um, but we did have a recent sighting of the plant out on Cypress Island in Skagit County. It was, um, this is a picture of that area where it was found, this lower right picture, and the plants were controlled. So at this time, we aren't aware of any populations occurring in Washington. It does prefer open areas, disturbed areas, um, agricultural settings or roadsides. So it can grow a lot of similar areas that also potentially you could find yellow star thistle. It's quick spreading by seed and we do have concern. It's thought it could cause a chewing disease, which is a disease yellow star thistle can cause if consumed by horses, but that hasn't been experimentally proven yet, but there is concern about that. Uh, control methods. So, um, they are similar to yellow star thistle if you have large populations. Really, we want to prevent. We want to prevent these plants from establishing, able to go to seed and spread. The site out at the Skagit County on Cypress Island was hand pulled. This is a picture of that happening. It was bagged and uh, taken away. And then for yellow, like yellow star, there are a number of herbicides that could be used. And then my very last uh, one, just to mention, is Eurasian water milfoil hybrid as a class C noxious weed. This is our one aquatic for today. So this is actually a hybrid species between Eurasian water milfoil, which is a class B noxious weed, and our native northern water milfoil. So in the lower left picture, you can see uh, these two. Here's the native at the top. Uh, these two you can tell apart, generally, uh, looking at morphological traits. But when these hybridize, and here's a picture of the hybrid in the center, we really can't rely on the structures alone to tell them apart, unfortunately. 
So it's producing uh, many of these hybrid uh, Eurasian wild milfoil strains um, for where it's been found. And we really need genetic analysis to uh, differentiate this plant from uh, the parent species. So where it has been documented so far is this map here um, in Washington. All these green dots have had plants found. Generally, these plants are found when people are controlling Eurasian water milfoil, and for some reason, the control has stopped being successful. So some of the hybrid strains of this Eurasian water milfoil hybrid are even more aggressive and can be difficult to control with the traditional herbicide used for Eurasian water milfoil. So if you have questions about this, we encourage um, you to contact me and I'll put you in touch with uh, the Washington State Department of Ecology. They've been doing some testing and some genetic studies on that. So just remember to keep an eye out for noxious weeds, ask for help in identifying unknown plants, and please remember to clean shoes, uh, vehicles, equipment to help spreading noxious weeds to new locations. So thank you. All right, thank you so much, Wendy, for that great presentation. We are at time, but Wendy's agreed to give us a little bit more of our time to answer a couple questions. We have a couple earlier questions. Um, what herbicides work well on English hawthorn? Um, for the English hawthorn, I know that they've been using um, like glyphosate to do those cut stem treatments, as well as um, triclopyr is something they were also using. I think those have been the most common too. And I would just note with um, herbicide, uh, recommendations. We generally steer people to the Pacific Northwest Weed Management Handbook. That's an online resource that details um, herbicides that you can use on our noxious weeds and gives you rates and different remarks. So just as a general good source to check on. Okay. So here's another good one. If we're disposing of noxious plant materials like the bulblets of Ara Metallicum, is it sufficient to just put them in a trash bag? Won't they just multiply later at the landfill location? Generally with um, plants that are bagged and taken to like a transfer station slash landfill, they will be uh, buried deep <laughs> within trash piles and soil. So that is not something that has uh, ever happened that we're aware of, that generally that amount of time in that environment will kill the plant. Okay. And I would just, um, as a note, for if you have any um, noxious weeds disposal questions, like can I put these plant pieces in my city uh, yard waste or not, um, we have, we generally steer people to their county noxious weed boards um, because they know with what their local transfer stations will accept. Okay. And I would want to add that a few county weed boards are also able to give you vouchers so that you may not even have to pay for that um, disposal fee. Oh, that's great. So this might be another um, one you steer toward your county weed board. How can I find out which state class D weeds are designated for control in my area? That's a great question. So at this on the state weed list, you would just see if you looked at our uh, list online, which ones are required by the state. You wouldn't then also see which ones your counties do require locally. So what you can do is go to your county uh, noxious weed board and generally all of them have a website and will post their weed list online. They adopt and update that weed list each year like we do, and that will tell you which ones are required control versus recommended control. Okay. Is there a list of species added to the state noxious weed list in 2019, or do I have to look over both the 2018 and 2019 list to see what has changed? So you could actually look at the 2018 list if you're just looking for new species. So we did not add any new species for 2019. What we did um, have happen is we did change some of the class B control requirements of your counties. So I would just say that um, for certain counties, you would just want to check maybe online to see if your local control requirements have changed. And but overall, we did not add any new species to the state noxious weed list. All right. I uh, will take one more question. Let's see. Could you explain why the Malta star thistle is a class B listing rather than a class A? That's a great question. So we listed it as a class B listing in part because we weren't sure of its distribution in the state. Um, because Malta star thistle is so similar in appearance to yellow star, we thought people may just actually have it and just be um, controlling it or not controlling it, depending on what their local requirements are for yellow star thistle. 
The idea, though, is now we are um, collecting uh, distribution information on it. And in time, that could be bumped up to a Class A noxious weed um, once we just essentially have better data about where the plant occurs. All right, well, thank you. We're going to stop at this point. Um, but again, I wanted to point out that this webinar is going to be added online to the Washington Pest Watch webinar series. And um, the Washington Pest Watch is a citizen science initiative led by agencies and universities that are the front line in protecting Washington's natural resources and economy from these invasive species. And the majority of our network members are everyday people who just keep their eyes out for signs and symptoms of high priority invasive species and then report them to the responding agencies to help us detect and rapidly respond to invasive species. So if you see something, say something. And um, please visit our website, theinvasivespecies.wa.gov, to see our upcoming in-person and other webinar trainings like the one we had today. There are a lot of great resources like a first detector handbook, different brochures, posters, and other great pre-recorded trainings and webinars just like the one we had today. So go ahead and check those out. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day.